Please remain standing this morning, if you are able, as we go to our God with His Holy Word. This morning's scripture reading comes from the book of Judges, chapter 7, verses 1 through 7. Once again, that is the book of Judges, chapter 7, verses 1 through 7. Let us now hear from God's holy word. Then Jerubbabel, who was Gideon, and all the people that were with him rose up early and pitched beside the well of Herod, so that the host of the Midianites were on the north side of them by the hill of Moray in the valley. And the Lord said unto Gideon, The people that are with thee are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands. Lest the Israel vaunt themselves against me, saying, My own hand hath saved me. Now therefore go to proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, Whosoever is fearful and afraid, let him return and depart early from Mount Gilead. And there returned the people twenty and two thousand, and there remained ten thousand. And the Lord said unto Gideon, The people are yet too many. Bring them down into the water, and I will try them for thee there, and it shall be that of whom I say unto thee, This shall go with thee. The same shall go with thee, and whosoever say unto thee, This shall not go with thee, the same shall not go. So he brought down the people into the water, and the Lord said unto Gideon, Everyone that lappeth up the water with his tongue, as a dog lappeth, him shall thou set by himself. Likewise, everyone that boweth down upon his knees to drink. And the number of them that lapped, putting their hand to their mouth, were three hundred men. But all the rest of the people bowed down upon their knees to drink water. The Lord said unto Gideon, By the three hundred men that lapped will I save you, and deliver the Midianites into thy hand, and let all the other people go every man unto his place. Let us pray. Father God, we come to you now. Lord, help us as we come in this time to be in your presence and to truly listen to the word and the message that you have for the people. Lord, help us to apply it to our lives each and every day. And God, we also ask you that as you guide my mind and my mouth that everything that proceeds from my lips be the truth. It's in your precious Son's name, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. I invite you now to listen as I read you a story about an underdog with very big, with a very big future. Yambul, Bulgaria was a rather ominous place. Memories of the Berlin Wall, which came down only a few years earlier, still hung in the air. The grass stood almost a foot tall in the, gra- in the cracks of the airplane runway, and barbed wire fences stretched around the perimeter of the airport. Armed soldiers stood just beyond and behind the fence and guarded the area. It wasn't exactly a warm welcome for foreigners, not to mention the fact that every sign was written in a southern Slavic language, making getting around on your own impossible. But Gigi and Stephen Bettendorf didn't travel 6,000 miles to check out the sites. They were there to pick up their four-year-old daughter, Mira. The Bettendorfs already had two boys at home in Norfolk, but Gigi wanted a girl. After seeing Mira, who was born with a form of dwarfism, in an adoption magazine, Gigi fell in love. Her pictures were so sad, Gigi said, it just just broke my heart that all they could see was what was going wrong with her. She was just this little tiny person, and she deserved a chance. Mira remembers her adoption day better than anyone. 
It's one of the most detailed days that I remember, Mira said. I remember we played our first game together with a blue ball covered in teddy bears. And I remember touching my dad's hair and asking him where it was because he was bald. After meeting Mira, Gigi and Stephen brought their new daughter to Norfolk. Mira spoke Bulgarian, so Gigi and Stephen learned some of the important parent phrases such as, Are you sick? Enough is enough? Do you hurt? And of course, I love you. Thirteen years later, Mira barely remembers Bulgarian, if at all. In her four years at Norfolk High School, and now ready to graduate with her fellow seniors on Sunday, Mira focused on practicing her instruments for band and studying for her classes. Her main instrument is the trumpet. For marching band, she had a smaller version of the instrument so that she could carry it while she walked. Mira participated in band for all four years of high school. When she had to undergo surgery to correct her legs, she timed the procedure so that the six-month recovery would end just in time for band to start. A piece of hardware from the surgery broke off in my foot, Mira said, but I marched in the band anyway. Mira often stayed after school to work with her band teacher, John Furrow, to learn the music and improve her skills. He never got tired of helping me, Mira said. I will get things if you just have patience with me. Just for fun, Mira plays the ukulele, piano, and a little bit of flute. Her hands were too small to play the guitar, so the ukulele was a good substitute. Plus, she just likes the sound it makes. Not being able to play the guitar stopped Mira from becoming a musical therapist because that instrument is required for the job. Now, instead of pursuing music after graduation, Mira decided to seek a career in occupational therapy. At first, I didn't know what to do with my life once I couldn't become a musical therapist, Mira said. Being little has hindered me in a lot of ways. Mira accommodates for her 3 foot 10 inch height by using a gas and brake pedal extension and higher seat for her car, by two sets of books for school and home because she can't carry heavy weights, and by purchasing smaller clothes. It's kind of hard to find a sneaker in a size one and a half without a picture of Dora the Explorer, Gigi said. It's not the little things like sneakers and pedal extensions that bother Mira, though. It's the lack of understanding from people a lot of times. Whether it's someone using the M-word or pitying her or thinking she's not as smart because of her size, Mira just wants to be treated equally. A person deserves the respect of being a person no matter how tall or short or fat they are, her mom said. Despite the day-to-day -day issues that have come along with her size, Mira wants to help people in need as an occupational therapist after getting her degree at Central Community College in Grand Island. I'm good at accommodating for myself, and I'm good at coming up with ideas for how to help others, Mira said. I like making an impact on people's lives. Mira said after graduating, she's going to miss band and all her friends in band. But she also said she's ready to start the next phase of her life. You can be small and do big things, she said. Mira's mom is a nurse, and her dad is a paramedic. So Mira is following in her parents' footsteps as she goes into the medical field. Her mom said she couldn't be more proud of everything Mira has and will accomplish in her life. Adopting her was one of the best things we ever did, Gigi said. She's a typical teenage daughter. Someday we're going to be best friends. But for right now, I'm just still her mom. We live in a world of underdogs. We live in a world of doubt, where people say, if you're too small, you can't do this. We have a habit, as a culture, pertain, relating strength and power to the size that you are. But in reality, true strength and true power has nothing to do with numbers. This morning, we look in the book of Judges, and the story of Gideon. Now during this time, the Israelites were under the thumb, the, cap the captivity, 
the command of the Midianites. Now, the reason for this was because the Israelites, as they were accustomed to doing, disobeyed God. And God brought them into the land of the Midianites, for the Midianites were over them. But finally, God heard the cry of His people. He did not forsake them. He did not forget them. And He was going to get them out of the hand of the Midianites. And so, He called upon a man by the name of Jerubbabel or Gideon. And Gideon was called to, to form an army. And his army was made up of 32,000 people. And he was called to go against the army of the Midianites that numbered 135,000 people. Now, let me put this in perspective for you for a second. 135,000 is a little more than four times bigger than 32,000 people. That's pretty intimidating, isn't it? That they're going to go against this gigantic army. And basically, it was the equivalent of Lamb Chop going against uh, Hulk Hogan in a wrestling match. That's what it, that was basically what it looked like. But this 32,000 people, God called upon Gideon. And after Gideon, after being a little bit doubtful, he finally, okay, this is what God wants us to do. So they were getting ready to go with this 32,000 men into, into war, in the battle against the Midianites. It's not a whole lot, but you know what? 32,000, that's enough. We're going to go in. Well, right before they get ready to go into war, God calls upon Gideon and says, Gideon, you've got too many people in your army. So this is what I want you to do. I want you... All the, all the soldiers in your command in this army that are afraid, I want you to send home. Now, to put it in perspective, the Gideon's army is on a mountaintop and they're looking down at the Midianites so they can see fully for themselves what they're up against. 22,000 soldiers of the 32,000 and Gideon's army left afraid to go home. That brought down his number of troops to 10,000 people. Now it's going to be 10,000 versus 135,000. This is crazy, isn't it? 10,000 people are going to take on 135,000 people. Well, this is still intimidating, even for the people that are left. But Gideon's saying, no, we're going to do this. This is what God calls us to do. So they get ready to, they get ready to go to battle, and then God comes to them again. And he says, Gideon, you still have too many people in your army. When we look at that, we're thinking, God, are you nuts? We, you, still have, you still have too many people, 10,000? But you never need to underestimate the power of God. You never need to underestimate the knowledge of God and the wisdom of God. And so Gideon listened, and God told Gideon, to lead his remaining troops, 10,000 troops, to a pool of water, or a river of water. And said, have them to go drink the water. And those that lap up the water like a dog, in other words, they're getting just the enough water that they need to survive. Those are the ones that will stay. But the ones who kneel down, bow down, and cup their hands to get, to get a lot of water. Those are the ones that you will send home. The amount of people that were left, so the ones that lapped up the water like a dog, numbered in 300 people. That was what was left. 300 people were going to go into battle against the Midianite army. And guess what? 300 soldiers defeated 135,000 Midianite soldiers. If you don't think that's incredible... Let me put another perspective for you. 300 is less than 1% of the original 32,000 soldiers that Gideon originally had. With less than 1% of his original command, they beat the Midianites. The glory of God was shown on that day. This victory proved four things. The first thing is... Is that God's presence and activity can ensure victory for his people. 
When God is in the center of whatever you're doing, if He has got the focus, you can bet your bottom dollar that He's going to come to you, even if you number in 300 people. Even if you have 12 people on a Sunday morning. God does not care about numbers. He took 300 men and they took down 135,000 soldiers. God is able to work mightily through a small, dedicated group of people. Which is totally mind-boggling because we've all been told that numbers matter. Have we not? I've heard that constantly. We're so caught up with numbers in our culture today. But what we do is we put our focus on the numbers instead of the one who gives us that strength to carry on even if we number 12 people or just 3 people. It is not about how strong we are physically. As the psalm says, it's not about, it's not about power and might. It's about the Spirit of God. It's about how, you, how strong you are in the Spirit. Because guess what? We as human beings, Gideon has... Gideon and his army, we cannot even begin to fathom and accomplish what accomplished in that battlefield. Gideon and his army didn't win that day. God did. It was only through the power of God that they were able to take down that enemy. Another story brings us into perspective of how small people can do big things. A scrawny little shepherd boy, teenager, with a slingshot took down an almost 10 foot gigantic giant with he had a sword and he had armor. And he took him down with one rock to the head by the power of God. God has a way of working through small numbers and small people to create big things. The second thing that's revealed in this victory is that spiritual alertness and dedication, not numbers, is what's important. God cares about your faith. As scripture says, faith can move mountains. Can you imagine trying to move a mountain by yourself? You're going to be there for a while. Faith in God allows us to do things that people say, what's that wonderful word? Oh yeah, impossible. It's impossible to achieve this with only this amount of people. It's impossible to achieve this with this little amount of money. What's impossible with God? Absolutely nothing. The third thing that's revealed is our ultimate resource and strength to meet all of life's challenges can be found in God. Manifested in Christ Jesus and in Him alone. In other words, God is going to supply every need that you have. So you're trying to go do a ministry out in the community and you only have five people. But you're five people that are on fire for the Lord where the rest of your congregation couldn't care less what you're doing. God is going to supply your need to feed the people in that community. To give them water. To do what needs to be done. Because God is with you. God was with The Israelites in the wilderness. He brought them to the promised land. He said, I will be with you. He said this even though that they would be discouraged in a lot of ways. He said this even though they would disobey Him again. But He let them know that no matter where they were, He would be with them day in and day out. It didn't matter what the state of things were. Because let me tell you something. The truth that's revealed is it doesn't matter how bleak things get. The doubts that creep in your mind. And we all get doubts. How are we possibly going to keep this church open? I've heard this a lot of times from different places. How often are we we going to keep this church open? How are we going to keep these doors open in this business, in this building? How are we going to do it? It's impossible because we don't have enough people. Nothing is impossible with God Almighty. Numbers do not matter. It is about your spirit. It's about your strength in the Lord. If David can slay Goliath with a pebble, I guarantee you that five people can put on an outreach event that feeds over 500 people. Because God is in the midst. 
And the fourth thing that's revealed is that pride in our accomplishments inevitably becomes a hindrance to receiving God's power and help. We never want to get to the point where we say, you did a good job feeding all these people. Man, we're good. They can really count on us. What we're doing is we're, bo we're boasting ourselves up instead of saying, we're only able to even do this because of the power of God. That's why on Sunday mornings a lot of times you will hear when people come out the door and they say, Pastor, it was a good sermon. Pastor, you're doing some great things. No, I'm not. I say thank you, but I say it's actually it's him who deserves all the credit because in reality, I am nothing without him. All I do is I'm willing to be able to be God to use me. And he uses anyone. As he used Mira, a girl of dwarfism, the society deemed a reject, but God deemed her a minister, a hope, someone who can help others. That's the whole point. When you say, you know, I'm not strong enough, exactly, but he is. We never want to get to the point where we give ourselves credit for doing something. That's why every time that we minister to someone, every time that we preach or give someone a godly wisdom, a tidbit of information from the Lord, we always give Him the glory. Always. Because He sustains us when the world kicks us to the curb. He is with us when all hope in the world is lost. It is God who deserves our thanks and praise. It is God who is at the center and needs to be the center of everything that we do in our lives. There is no flesh should glory in His presence. It is not about us. It is about God through Jesus Christ. So brothers and sisters, remember that it's not about numbers. Rather, it's about our faith in God and the power of God. And let us commit to memory that it does not matter how strong we are, how much money we have in our checking accounts, or in our pillowcases. It doesn't matter how many resources you have. Because without God, we would have, and we would be, nothing. Amen?